Can you all hear me? Great. Yes, so um, my name is Vilas and I finished my PhD two years ago more or less at TTU. And um, thank you. And during that project, I, um, I worked with Bang & Olufsen in order to create white aluminium. And I guess that's kind of the key disruptive element in my talk. Maybe I'll first talk about another disruptive element, which happened yesterday when I was about to leave to go to Copenhagen. I was going to the university to pick up some samples I would have wanted to present today, but there's been a power disruption. And uh, all the doors um, and uh, smart card facilities were locked, so I couldn't get into my own office. So we'll have to do without those. Now, um, I'm working at University of Cambridge at the Department of Chemistry, even though I know nothing about chemistry. But I'm doing that because um, there we are trying to recreate some of the biomimetic concepts I'll introduce to you later in a bulk fashion. So you would take basically some materials, shake them and bake them and so on, until you get um, photonic materials out of it. And, um, and that's why we're located in chemistry. So. We're like a group with a few chemists with a lot of chemistry knowledge and a lot of physicists and material scientists. But back to that later. First things first. Just like um, uh, the organizers, I've also decided to um, break down my title. So it's white aluminium by by inspiration. First, I will tell you about white aluminium and how I got involved in the project, and then I will tell you about how bio inspiration helped in this project, and uh, then and outlook focusing on, on what we are doing now. So the project I worked in was called ODAS, Optically Designed Anodized Aluminium Surfaces, and it was funded by Danish High Technology Foundation um, and initiated by Bang & Olufsen. And for those of you who may not know Bang & Olufsen, they are Danish design committee producing high-end electronics, and uh, their kind of trademark material for a lot of their products is aluminium. So you can kind of compare them to Apple in the sense that they make expensive things and they often use aluminium. Besides Bang & Olufsen, there were a few collaborative partners from DTU. I was in mechanical engineering at the time and um, Rishu DTU performed some work as well. And then Danish technology of, yeah, Danish, I don't know what it's called in English, but Technological Institute. And the overall scope was to obtain an anodized white appearance of aluminium to extend B&O's design possibilities beyond their current limitations. And this may sound like a really, really small and very feasible task, especially if you look at B&O's current products. Um, sorry? Ah, okay. This is um, like a telephone designed by B&O, and as you can see, it comes in all sorts of colors, even in white. But if we take a closer look at the shell of the cell phone, it's actually um, spray painted. So it's kind of a thick lacquer on top of it that creates the white color, whereas all the other versions of the telephone, they're just pure aluminum that has been treated in order to create the color. And the difference is that the white version, it looks and feels like a fridge, basically. You don't have any feeling of the metal, and the metal is the trademark of what they're doing. So it's kind of really prohibitive in creating nice design products, nice elegant products in white. And why is that so? So the thing is when you so-called anodize aluminium, you grow a layer of aluminium oxide on top of it using electrochemistry. You create some pores in the surface, regularly spaced, with a diameter of maybe 15 to 20 nanometers. And those pores can be filled with um, dyes in order to obtain colors. So if we say we have light incoming here, white light is a combination of all visible lights, so basically a combination of red, green, and blue. You could have a dye that absorbs green and blue color in order to create a red um, mirror metallic effect on your red phone. But in the case of white, you would then need to have all the colors reflected. And the thing is, it's just not perceived as white anymore. The color is perceived as mirror-like, kind of standard metallic-like, but nobody would see it as white. And white is a very fashionable color at the moment. And um, a good example is that soon after we started the project, the iPhone 5, I guess, was launched. And it came in a black version with a nice 
black anodized uh, finish on the back and in a white version, which turned out to be plastic with a really hard layer of glass on top of it or something similar in order to kind of recreate this effect. So, so there's a general interest also in creating white and, and there's a focus on it. But as, as shown here, there's just no analogy between the different colors we can make of aluminum and creating white aluminum. And still white is something we would want. So it's, it's and I guess that's kind of the disruptive element. You, you want something because it would be a game changer in respect to what you can, um, can design and, um, and to separate yourself from competitors, but it just doesn't exist. So how can we at least create the impression of something white? I guess first of all we would need to know what white is then when it's not just a reflection of all colors. It's white is instead scattered reflection of all colors. So if you have, again, white light incoming on the surface and it's scattered in all directions, you lose the feeling of a mirror and you get something which you perceive as white. This is what happens in clouds where you have a lot of small water droplets or in snow or in milk for that matter's sake. And in white paint what you do is that you take a transparent resin and you mix titanium dioxide particles in it, just like here, so the light is scattered back in all directions and you give the perceived feeling of white. Um, in the beginning of the project we then tried to at least visualize what color effect we, we wanted to get out of it. So we created a simple 3D computer rendering of a standard metal. And if we would remove the green and the blue, comp the red and the blue component in this model, we would get a green colored looking metal as expected. And if we would kind of enhance all color components to reflect equally, we would get something which would look a bit like silver. That is simply because silver is probably um, the ma standard material, standard metal we know that reflects all colors most equally. And if we then also added some diffuse scattering, which is what you get if you have a white paint or something, we could get it to look some sort of whitish, um, at least in comparison to the other metals. The only problem here is that this is an artificial model and actually so there's no energy conservation, actually these structures emit more light than what is actually incident on them. So there's kind of an inherent problem there. But you can say this is the goal we're kind of aiming um, towards in the project, or we did aim towards. And in this respect, um, just to emphasize how important visual appearance is to a product, uh, I can really recommend reading this um, article. I also wanted to print it before leaving, but since I couldn't get into my institute, you can maybe send me an email, I can send an electronic copy. It's, it's a really good uh, article describing how humans perceive materials and um, how we then apply mechanical properties to that materials. And it also mentions the fact that um, from time to time, material scientists create new materials with completely new appearances. And I think the fact that you have a possibility to create a material that is with a visual appearance that has never been seen before gives you also the possibility to shape how this material is perceived. So say you would invent white aluminium and only use it in really durable, good-looking designs. That would be the only way um, people perceive the product then, and you would have, yeah, um, like you would have all the possibility in the world to shape the impression of this material, at least until somebody caught up and used it in a cheap China product, as we talked about earlier today. So this is, this is probably one of the key to why um, it would be of such big value to invent white aluminium, because you can play around with the perception of a whole new material, um, and you can kind of shape it as you want. That's a bit of background of, of why we wanted to do um, white aluminium, and now I'll focus a bit more on, on my contribution to it, and how we have kind of taken out it in the bio-inspiration. So, the most classical example when it comes to colors and visual appearance um, and so-called structural colors, within my field is this morpho butterfly. I wish I would have it here today, but it's still in the office. So it's got this really, really brilliant metallic blue appearance. It's 
much more brilliant than what you could paint using any sort of dye. And um, that has intrigued scientists for quite a few years, and with recent nanotechnology, so say within the, the last 20, 30 years, we've been able to investigate this much further. And the research going on in this has then sparked off um, a lot of other work. So I'll, I'll just explain you this as a kind of motivation to the whole work. work. So if you zoom in on a part of the wing, you'll see that it's covered in the scales, all these individual dots, and they're all blue. And if you keep zooming in, now using a, an electron microscope, so the colors is lost, but what you see is still the structure, you'll see that these scales, so this one here represents a single dot on the image before, consist of a lot of ridges when you zoom in further. And you can see there's a scale by here, so now we're talking about three micrometers. Um, and if you look at a cross-section of those ridges, they have this Christmas tree-like looking um, structure. And actually it's called Christmas tree-like structure by other scientists as well, so it's not something I'm making up or making it more accessible. It's just what it's called. Um, and the spacing between these lamellas here, they then determine the color which is, is reflected due to interference. And uh, that is how the color is controlled. And if we go a step back, and the way these um, Christmas tree-like um, extruded structures are distributed on the surface of the petal, then all in all kind of confines the blue light in a more narrow range. So say you have light incoming from all angles, but it's just reflected back in a more narrow cone. And that is what intensifies the light um, so much and make it appear much more blue than um, what would be possible through pigmentation. This also means that if you look at the butterfly from very grazing incident angles, it appears really dark, but from most normal um, viewing angles, it's just strikingly brilliant blue. And it has been observed from airplanes that can be in general seen kilometers away if you just catch it um, with the right um, angle. And I guess I won't talk too much about the biology side of it, but it's probably used for communication between um, species. So how can this be explained? Um, in the beginning I showed you an example of absorption, so how we can add dye to aluminium in order to remove some of the light, convert it to heat, and then have a certain color reflected. Also talked about so-called incoherent light scattering, which is when you have a lot of scattering processes creating a diffuse uh, appearance, just like white. And then there's this last part called coherent scattering, where you have interference phenomena um, going on. And Current scattering can be explained very simple, so say if we look at this soap bubble, it's actually made of a transparent material, but still we perceive a color. And that is because of the thin film that the soap bubble consists of. So say we have a wave, light wave here, of a certain visible uh, wavelength, traveling in free space. If we then have it incident on the um, um, film of the soap bubble, you would have some of the light reflected off straight from the surface, and you would have some propagating down to the back surface and up again, and then reflected off. And uh, the combination of those two waves and then light incident all over on the surface would, would create the overall perceived color effect. So I put the other wave here to exemplify the other part being reflected. And if these two are in phase due to the fact that the wave here has traveled just one period extra to get back to the surface, you would get a constructive interference effect, which kind of enhances the, the color you're seeing. On the other hand, if this path length is changed, or if the wavelength is changed, you may have a mismatch in shift, which kind of decreases the overall intensity we receive, and you may, ha may have total destructive interference as well, which means that there's actually no color reflected. And it's the same principle applied to the butterfly, so by controlling the spacing of the ridges of the Christmas tree, you can control the color, basically. A really um, good textbook example of that is this beetle here. Um, both the green and the red colored uh, are due to layers of different biomaterials on the surface. This is the red part, where the distance between the layers is longer because red has longer wavelength than, the, than blue and green. And this is then um, the physical structure which gives the, the blue-green appearance that you see here. 
So it's like nature's own nanofabrication lab um, we're looking at here. And the effects can be much more elaborate, um, like in peacock feathers. I guess an example most of you know. There you have really, really regular inclusions of air bubbles in each and every single feather that creates this um, shimmering light play. Again, something which is not obtainable using normal dyes because it requires this kind of structure to select and uh, redirect um, light in order to get the color effect. And it's also present in a completely different way to create white, um, in this white beetle, for example, which has a really, really intricate network, um, which actually scatters light much more efficient than the white paint. Um, and scientists are, for example, working on trying to reproduce these structures in order to have um, a really, really efficient way of producing light um, white. The thing is, though, for our purpose, this white is definitely not the white we want for aluminium because it's really diffuse and it's got no um, metallic appearance. And I could go on. I've just added a photo here of, um, of a few everyday examples to kind of show you that it's not something which only happens in warm, nice countries, but also in Denmark. And I thought maybe it's a good idea just to take 30 seconds in order to to understand this, like I think it's it's really really great. Um, so I will actually give you just a little time to think about it. Yeah, because then I think I will move onto how we can utilize this knowledge um, in order to, to actually propose methods to create colorful surfaces. First of all, um, it's been possible to um, recreate, so biomimic, you can say, the, the color of the morpho butterfly very successfully by a group in Japan, Japan led by Akira Saito. And, um, and I find it really interesting also being as at this type of event that actually people are able to reproduce the color, but still you haven't seen it on any products because, first of all, for some reason this guy in Japan is not very, like his work is not as appreciated as it should be. And also there's still a lot of manufacturing um, implications to overcome. But um, I think it's really worthwhile because here you actually have a prototype of a color that nobody's been able to, to produce before. And it's just uh, up, up for grasp if you can, um, if you can um, convert it into a product. So I think that's something which is really worth thinking about. Um, and uh, during the, the work of our project, we then started off saying, OK, forget all limitations. If we had complete design freedom to so kind of mimic these Christmas tree-like structures, or just the whole working principle, what could we get out of it? Could we, for example, design a surface that when light was incident on it, it looked red from one side and blue from another? So um, we developed a computer algorithm to, to work on that, and uh, we succeeded in creating, at least theoretically, such a structure. We haven't been able to produce it because the distance from here to here is one micrometer, I think, so it's it's really, really small. And the two materials, so the black is um, titanium dioxide and the white is silicon um, oxide. So in principle, we can do whatever we want with these materials. And in order to, um, to kind of smoothen out this effect, we would also have to um, randomize uh, the surface a bit, um, which is also very similar to what the butterfly does. But the thing is, given complete design freedom, we can actually design almost any surface we want uh, with any kind of color appearance we want. Um, but that doesn't really work well for white aluminum. So what would work well for white aluminum? Well, we know already that in order to, um, to create a red color, we would have to fill out the green and the blue. But that doesn't work for us. We can't use absorption. So we would have to get everything reflected back at us. 
But at the same time, we would want to create a disturbance which kind of scatters light everywhere, so you get the feeling of something much more white, just like the last um, computer graphics image I showed you. And at the same time, you would need to retain some mirror effect, so you get the feeling of having a metal. And then the rest of the feeling of aluminium would come from touch and feel and uh, how it's been processed and so on. But that's really important. So in the end, some of the things I proposed, um, we were a project of maybe 10, 15 people, where most of the others were material scientists, um, and some of the ideas were also developed, like of, obviously in collaboration with the others, was just to um, create some small holes in the surfaces where you like smaller than what the eye could resolve and then just put white paint in it um, in order to create such a structure. That turned out to be extremely difficult to get paint down in so small holes on the surface, so we had to give that up. Also, you could actually apply the principles of the blue morphomimetic surface I just showed to, to create white um, by first patterning the, the aluminium surface with a semi-random pattern looking something like this and then afterwards um, coated with a lot of different layers just like the beetle in order to enhance um, reflectivity. The problem is though that such a process would be too advanced for for the scope of our project and, and we had to discard this idea without testing it. And I think that's a real shame, but um, that's how it is, at least that's how I see it working with industry. You, you need to make compromises, which makes sense if you want to get anywhere in the real world. Um, a third thing we uh, did and which actually turned out reasonably successful what to, was to add optical brightener, um, which you used for for creating really white clothes as well. So what that does is that it takes UV light, so invisible light to the human eye, and, and convert it to um, blue light actually, but due to an enhancement of the blue light, overall you get a much more white appearance. So in that way we were able to take some energy which was not visible and convert it into a part of the visible um, appearance of the object. There are some practical problems here. First of all, um, in the old days, you would use incandescent light bulb to light up your rooms, and they have a, a natural large amount of UV light in it, but now that we're switching to LEDs and to fluorescent lamps, these um, don't contain that much UV light, so actually the product may not um, be very... <laughs> like It may actually change appearance in the long run due to change of alternating um, technologies. So this is still being used extensively, especially for things worn outdoor, like white sneakers or something, but, but for an indoors product, actually it wouldn't work. So in the end, uh, what we spent a lot of time on was then to mix um, white paint particles in the aluminum, in the raw substrate, and then anodize it, and then make sure to have a really smooth surface so that we could get um, a wide appearance out of it as well. And that seemed to work quite well. Um, yeah, you may say that this is a lot of fuss just for, for doing the obvious thing, but, um, but um, understanding the problem actually was a big deal of, of a big part of coming up to to this solution, and also incorporating these titanium dioxide particles in the aluminium took, say, one year or something like that, and was real pain. Luckily, not my pain, though, since I'm not the material scientist in the project. And I would have wanted to show the real results, but I don't think I'm allowed to, so I'll just show this blurred image. Um, but if you would want to have a look at it, I can just show it to you on my computer screen afterwards. So, so we did managed to create some samples which were thoroughly white and um, it's then up to the designers to, uh, to find out whether or not these are actually usable for, for making products. And also it's up to the mechanical testing department to find out if the materials are durable enough. And an interesting spin-off is that if you have these particles in the substrate, you lose this mirror effect to a certain extent at least, so you can also create the range of, um, of colors you already have by, by using the same setup and then come putting dye in. And instead of getting the appearances we, we saw before, with the same dyes you would actually get a much more pastel-like um, color. 
effect. So that's, that's like a, a, another benefit of it. So in two ways, you would be able to expand your range of, um, of colors and visual appearances in a way which has not been, been seen before in aluminum. All right. Um, and then I've included last part a bit about Outlook. So that's more uh, about what I'm doing now. I'm in a group of so-called bio-inspired photonics people uh, in Cambridge. And if you want to visit the website, there's a link here. And what we do is then to take these uh, auto concepts of uh, coloration in nature oh, and, and try to, um, to recreate just the principles. So instead of biomimicry, this is more bio-inspiration, you can say. Um, and well, if you're interested, we can discuss the difference afterwards, but it's not that important. So an example in nature is um, of another way of coloration is this green beetle here. And it has a structure just underneath the surface, which consists of a lot of fibrils, which are rotated in a stack. And that's another way to interfere with light and only selectively reflect, reflect a part of it. And the thing is, the light which is reflected back then has a certain polarization. So that would say, if you put on just normal cinema glasses when you go to th watch a 3D movie, you would see it looking like that with one eye and like this with the other eye. And again, a sample would have been really nice. And this working principle we can also apply um, in other ways. So what we've done is that we take a lot of fibers from some natural uh, source like wood pulp and you would do a so-called acid hydrolysis in order to to clean it and filter it and so on um, and then you will get out something which is called cellulose nanocrystals but it's like just crystalline fiber structures you can say and um, if you then cast them as a film and let it dry they will automatically rearrange in the same pattern so in these like twisted structures, which means that we're able to, um, to produce um, surfaces like this, just using wet chemistry. So this could be applied like in bulk um, processes as well, or in principle at least. What to do with it though? So one thing you can try to do is that you can try and form small droplets of it. So this is a so-called microfluidic system where you actually have small um, um, tubes where you send just um, a flowing stream of this material full with CNC's through and then you cut it off by having um, continuous oil pressure pumping through so you would get droplets out of it and these droplets then would also form in this chiral um, color and, and you would be able to, to get um, so this is maybe a 20 micrometer uh, droplet looking like this, really colorful. And the hope is that if we would um, treat it correct, you could use such kind of um, only organic made um, materials as for example, coloration when you would paint or whatever. At the moment though, they, when they dry and evaporate, they still crumble. So they look like this. Um, and, and that's of course not ideal. But um, as we can see, if we zoom really in on a fractured version of this, um, the structure that we want is, is still retained. So, so several groups around the world are, are working with this at the moment. So that's one interesting and really big application of taking inspiration from nature. Another one is to use a similar material, but with, with the same kind of ordering. So this is hydropropyl cellulose. And it's um, a polymer which also arranged in, in this way, like um, twisted structure. And it's actually edible, so it could be used in food products as well. And part of this work is carried out in collaboration with Mars in order to see if you can color Mars bars in funny ways. And, um, and furthermore, it's quite compressible. So when you push it, um, like here, you would um, or compress it you would see a shift in color due to the fact that you, you compress the different layers. So it's, it's also a functional material and, um, and really flexible, easy to work with. So here, one of my colleagues kind of just made a handprint um, on a large, I think, A4 sized sheet of the, this material. So it's, it's kind of 
a new way to um, to um, look at and interact with colors, and it's also a way which which can be done only using organic materials. And that leads to my conclusion. So first of all, does white aluminium now exist? Well, I can show you the photo and then you can decide for yourself whether or not it, it exists. But it's interesting that um, so much effort has been put into creating something which inherently doesn't exist, but would create a lot of opportunities if you at least could mimic the effect. Um, and I think a really interesting point in this forum is that visual appearance can be designed and it can be tailor-made in so many ways, especially now that we have a lot of nanotechnology tools that allow for in investigation on a nanoscale level what you're doing and also control it. And if you have a new appearance, you basically have a new material to play around with. So it's really something which um, separates yourself from um, all other um, products out there. And I think during this project, at least, it's been important to have awareness of the gap between lab scale and production scale um, when we carried out the ex experiments, but also to forget it um, once in a while, because if we hadn't had this big detour about what was theoretically possible, we just wouldn't have had that many thoughts on, um, on the actual appearance of uh, white aluminium. And, um, and that was really key to, um, to find at least a, a decent solution in the end. And I think that's it. I'll be happy for any questions. Um, so, <laughs> that's okay. So, so, uh, so, B and O are at the moment trying to to see if they can um, get it into a, a production ready state. Um, it's still a bit expensive to fabricate, and I think it it still breaks quite easily or something like that. I I don't remember because that's happened after I left the project, but um, they're still working on it. I've noticed that Bang & Olufsen have just released a, a little Bluetooth speaker around one called Beoplay or something, I can't remember, but it's yeah. green. It's aluminium. Green? Yeah. Um, and matte. It's not painted on like those telephones. It looks like it's actually structurally coloured. But does that mean that green is easier to do or is that not done in the same way? Um, so that's a good question. So I, th I think that refers to... Um Um, to, to, to what we saw here, that if, like for, for all the other colors, you, you can just add dye to, to these pores that are naturally created on the surface, and in that way you still um, retain the effect. Um, you said it was matte as well? Completely matte. Completely matte. And, well, actually afterwards it's, it's then possible to, um, to brush it or, or to roughen the surface in order to, to remove the mirror effect, if, if that's the case. So that's much easier to, to make than, than white. Uh, Eric, just to clarify, what you said it looked like structural color. Did it, was it angle dependent? Or? No, no, nothing like that. No. Oh. But it, it wasn't painted. It was all painted on. I mean, it looked like it was part of the aluminium. Okay, um, I'm just wondering if there are um, other industries, you mentioned uh, Bang & Olufsen and yeah. uh, Mars, but are there other, other industries that, uh, that want this kind of uh, structural uh, coloring at the moment? Um, like, from time to time we get interest from different industries, but the thing is they're also very unaware of the technology, so I think it's still a lot of trying to find common ground to, to build on. I was at a conference lately where, for example, two, um, like, I don't know what they're called, well, two employees from Nike was there, um, and it was a conference only on structural colors, actually, and colors in nature. And, and the sole purpose was to try and find uh, things they could take home. 
So I think there is definitely a growing interest in it. Um, but still, a few product, only very few products has come out where you've actually had this um, found a common ground you could build a product on. Okay, thanks. Uh, have you ever run with uh, with uh, maybe a possible application of this in product authentication? One more in product. Product authentication that. Product health. Uh, that that uh, the maybe a, for example a spare part is really from the real source or not the uh, not the. Oh. That's 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 a very good point. Actually, also coming back to you. So. Uh, one big application going on already is, is counterfeit in all sorts of ways. So, creating like diffraction patterns and the bills and um, and logos, which are hard to reproduce in order to, yeah, to ensure that genuity. That that is actually a big application already. There, though, you need uh, much less control of the color. Like as long as it, it, it looks sparkly and colorful from different angles. You still have something which is hard to, to reproduce, um, but kind of the design side of it is, is less important there. I'm sure, having been at a conference for structural colors, there must be a lot of applications that, that you've seen there. Um, but one, 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 thing, one thing I, I, I think of, uh, I saw some years ago that, that you could make what they called cold black, uh, yeah. where you applied structural colors, uh, or so, so you reflect anything but, uh, but the visual, yeah. and that way you could yeah, reflect all the infrared. Yeah. So it looked black, but it wasn't that much heat did not, did not go through. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think, again, that's like a technology with really, really interesting potential. Um, but I don't know of anyone who's used it in an application. I think, I think the cold black, there was a Swiss textile producer which used okay. it in, in, in their garments. Yeah. So, uh, and also in paint. So. Yeah. Actually, maybe another example I, I come to think of is uh, chocolate, like uh, injection molded chocolate with kind of diffraction gratings on top that looks a bit like, say, a CD or something, which is a really angle-dependent pattern. I've, I've seen that as well, but that's more like a gimmick um, <laughs> because they can't transport it anywhere, then it starts to melt and, and they lose the effect. But I think that has created a lot of publicity for the, for the company, at least. Good. I think there's no more questions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and I have a little <laughs> questions.